For this big interview, I met Steve Archibald in the great city of Barcelona, where both of us now live. To hear about Stevie's adventures with FC Barcelona, listen to part two of this interview, which is out soon. Coming up now is the making of a player who'd become one of the most successful British exports to continental football, let alone La Liga. Like all great stories about this game we love, Steve's is rooted in that other footballing mecca, Aberdeen. You'll hear about how he won trophies in the first side Alex Ferguson constructed at my beloved Pataudry, but most fascinating, I think, is the way that Steve breaks down what he was learning about the craft of his position, centre forward, during this period. He speaks about the art of centre forward play brilliantly. Steve also had an exceptional career in a great Spurs side, and I know there are many out there who support that club waiting for this. However, after, I don't know, nearly 30 big interviews, for the first time we had serious technical problems while we were recording, and we lost the part of the interview where Steve was talking about his time at Tottenham and the World Cups he played in for Scotland. So you can't hear about how Mickey Hazard could have played in the Guardiola Barca team. You won't hear about how Steve performed two songs in the same episode of Top of the Pops and has a Blue Peter badge. But it's all true. We're genuinely sorry to all of you, particularly to Spurs fans and to Steve too. To make amends, here's some news. Steve met us while he was in the early stages of writing his long-awaited autobiography. It should be ready later in 2017, and we will tell you when it is. Listening to this interview, you'll probably come to the same conclusion I have, having known Steve for many years. This has been a unique football life, and Steve possesses a unique, articulate, and uncompromising voice with which to tell it. Enjoy. Enjoy. Here we are back on the big interview. One of the uh, big interviews that most excites me because apart from you having uh, changed my life, it's your fault that I'm here. So when I'm standing at the camp now and poor old Xavi has to listen to my, or Iniesta has to listen to my question for the umpteenth time and they all look at me and kind of look at the ears and try and work out what I'm saying in Scottish <laughs> Castellano. It's kind of your fault because when I left London, Louise said, listen, let's go and live in Spain. I went, yes, please. And mm. she was like, where should we go? As you know, Barcelona wasn't a particularly strong football club at that instant in 2002. And I went, well, Steve Archibald, world-class dandy. Barcelona's good enough for him. <laughs> it's, it's good enough for me. Yeah. Does that scare you, having that much influence on some random Scottish journalist like me? No, not my influence on you, but your thought process really scares me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sadly, it's wholly, wholly true. But using that to, to come into something that genuinely did alter my life, and I've said to people before, when, when you were part of that first phase of Alex Ferguson's emergence as a, as a dominant coach, that football team that you played in did make me, aged 15, 16, think, if you're very determined, if one is very determined, if one is ambitious, you can really achieve strange things. And I'm referring to the fact that you brought Aberdeen's first title since 1955 to Pataudry. And there are things about that, that that I want to ask you about. And what st- stays with me is that there was an accumulation of matches, postponed games. It meant that you had to play about five Celtic games in two days or something at Parkhead. Mm. And you went there as part of a group that, that, that beat Celtic twice at Parkhead. What was the atmosphere in that club, that dressing room like? Why, why did that Aberdeen group win the title that year? Well, first of all, if you know, you mentioned a bit ambition. If you ambition can take you a long way, but it can't take all the way. You've got to have ambition combined with talent, and uh, so the ambition <clears throat> combined with the talent that we had in the team, and a determined manager, and somebody who wanted to make his way in the game, and and uh, you know, there's moments in 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 your life and in your career where things come together a little bit and then you need a little bit of glue to, to you know to bring the, the, the parts closer and, and really make it work and I suppose that's what uh, Alec Ferguson did he, he instilled a, a determination into us and a, a belief and a pride and a desire a lot of different things but just by little things that he was saying and doing every day and, and not particularly in coaching because the players were all good players and, uh, and, and experienced pros but and I think he recognised that. So it really is his combination of of um, his character, our character, and our uh, on our ability that team's ability, that group's ability that uh, they made it all happen. And then we got 
you know, we got the 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 mindset of Fergie sort of gradually drifting drifting into ours, and then just that belief, and then we won games, and it just it was a gradual build up, I suppose, and then you know it very quickly turned into something very strong. And then we recognised within the group that we were we were a talented group, and if we had luck with injuries, then we could go pretty far. It strikes me in everything I've ever heard you say, everything I've watched you do, that you, you're not you're certainly not easily intimidated. Intimidation isn't something that has ever touched you in a sporting sense. No, intimidation from where? From from pressure, hostile crowds, oh, no. dangerous opponents, people kicking you. No, well, you uh, you know you get a sense as as a player around about you where players are, and, and as a striker especially, you've got to know where the centre half is or the guy that's marking you. So you get that sort of radar around about you, and you you know and I like to feel where he is, and and so you get to know very quickly, and then the defender can never dictate to you. And what I always did was you have to as a striker if you want to be a striker and and lose your marker and score goals and and and. To get rid of that pressure of, of potential violence against you, then you've got to be you've got to be thinking way ahead of the defender. You've got to be thinking ahead of your your teammates. You've got to be thinking ahead of the whole game. And so, if um, if my centre back's got the ball, and I can see it's going to go into the midfield player. And I know that midfield player's got X limitation. I know that whoever it may be, he may be a long ball guy, and maybe somebody's going to look for me to come short to play in and uh, give him it back and it just depends on that player it goes into it depends on where you're going to move the defender before it even goes into him in Aberdeen circumstances for example it's Gordon Strachan it's going into him I know he's not going to play something over the top he's going to give it to me and get it back because this type of player he is he wants, he, he wants to control the ball because he's a quality player and he wants to drive the game so if I know that I know it's going into him I'm taking the defender away to come back he thinks I'm going away all of a sudden I check back I get the ball in, I play it back, and the defender's nowhere near me. So you've got space then? Yeah, you've got to play way ahead of the, the game as a striker. It's a beautiful description because I, I, I find, I'm going to come back to the, the intimidation thing. I was also going to, I'm going to ask you about you know, those games at Parkhead, Parkhead in general, because from the outside, if you're a fan, if you're a journalist, you imagine these are intimidating atmospheres because they're no, noisy, they're hostile, they're places where teams traditionally lose, referees might or might not be against you, these kind of things. But you take me on to something where I always admired that you were a striker that also knew exactly what the ball was for. It was for keeping, it was for using intelligently. It was that very precious thing. Your ability to hold it, your touch, your shielding, mm. I always thought was first class. Yeah, well, the, 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 you know, when you get a ball as a striker, depending on where you are on the pitch, if you're in the box, then, then it's one mindset. If you're just over the halfway line is another one because you know it depends how the ball comes to you and everything else but the key factor when you're trying to play the ball from the back and into the striker the striker's got to keep it because if you lose it it just bounces straight back on you and through you again and you've got a chance to go and then it takes if you don't keep it then the uh, the guy that's giving it to you is going to think twice the next time before he gives it to you or he's going to send you into the channel because he knows you can't keep it so I'm sending him up there to make sure we get up the pitch and they're right back at us so You've got to be able to keep it and do a lot of other things. Uh, but for a striker, you've got to have a good touch and you've got to be able to keep it and you've got to take the knocks when they come because you can't always lose a defender. But my philosophy was uh, a lot of the times in that kind of situation when you're in the middle of the park and that's where you're going to get the ball and you know it's where you're going to get it. You're not going to get it over top. You're going to get it there. And then just to, to keep in touch with the, the, the defender, just back into him a little bit and then come off short. And then he can't get you. You've really quickly given first-class exposition of centre-forward, central striker play, that every word you've said would equally apply to Barcelona and Manchester City last night as to yeah, 1979-80 when you went in the title with Aberdeen. Yeah. Nothing's changed. Where did, that, where did your ability to do these things, more of which we'll talk about later, come from? Just natural. It's just a gradual progression and, and you, you learn to know because you know very quickly. Uh, I remember playing at Ibrox and... And uh, Tom Forsyth was sent centre half, and Tom Forsyth was a unforgiving <laughs> defender, and and uh, you know he wanted to let you know right away. And so early on in my career, I got you know even right over the ball to me, hit my shin, took a chunk out my leg, and you know and he almost ended my career. Whether he did it deliberately or not, we'll never know. But I doubt it. He was just a big guy, and he came in and he was going to get the ball or get me one or two. But uh, anyway, he took a chunk out. So, but all these little things that go on, you learn quickly. What's for you and what's not for you? 
you know, and you, you learn how to, you know, get a little angle there and, and, and how to fend him off and then take him in there because you want to go in there. There's just a, a multitude of different things uh, to lose a defender, to take any, if you get any fear factor at all, to get rid of that. So you, 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 you progress, your, your learning curve is, has got to be quick and it's got to be correct. And luckily mine was quick and, and, and correct and I was able to, to handle defenders and knew where I wanted to take them before I, wanted to, before I went back to what I really wanted to do. So you've got to sell a story to a, a central defender, if you're a striker or a right back, whoever it is, you've got to sell the story way before the ball's anywhere near you and lull them into false insecurity and then do what you want to do. Movement? Because... Talk? <clears throat> Did you nip at him? Did you put him off? No. Did you just I dragged just... him to where he didn't no. want to be? I gave him comfort. I wanted to let him think that he was mar- he, he had me. And so when, you know, when working, because defenders are all ball watchers, every single one of them. Every one of them, all the defenders last night, uh, every game you want to watch, they're ball watchers, because they've got, got to watch the ball. And that's the main thing, they've got to watch the ball to take the position off the ball. They can't watch the, the, the striker, they never take a position off a striker. Can't. They've got to watch the ball, take okay. position off the ball, okay. and then, you know, and then balance the striker. So you've got to lull them into that false sense of security, make them think that they've got you. Because you know, uh, as I said to you before, when the ball's coming into midfield or, or wherever it is, you want just to walk towards them always when the ball's not in your area. When you're not going to do something, you've got to walk close to them to let him think that he's got you. But he's not got you, you've got him. And you just walk him in there and he wa- he's watching the ball, watching the ball... And then I know that the ball's going to come from the defender into the midfield and I start drifting away and he's still watching the ball and then they lose it and I start walking back and he's not even looked and then he turns and I'm close to him again. He didn't know I was away. And, and that's how you do it. False sense of security. If there are, if you, in those days, I'm certain, every team played a back four. Two def- wide defenders, two full-backs, two centre-halves. Maybe you might call them a sweep or whatever. How would you would you choose which of them was the more stupid or the or the duller of mind of in course. order to go and go and play in the weak link? Of course, so you would occupy him and leave the strong one alone. Well, like, it depends on where it was in pitch, but you know if the if the um, if the keepers uh, got the ball in his hand, I know it's going to come up. Then I'll go and play. I'll go and on, on, on top of the the, the weakest uh, defender. Of course, I will. I won't, it'd be stupid to go and stand stand next to. the... the the strongest defender, right? The reason I ask that is I sometimes see teams say, right, there's, a, there's, a, there's maybe a stronger defender and a weaker defender, and sometimes if you leave the weaker defender alone, he won't know where to be and he won't know where to go, and he may wander and give space. Mm. No, if he's a weak defender, go and play him. Go and, go and play. Yeah, because I've pressurise him. him. Yeah, I've got him. I know I can do what I like with him. So Tom Forsyth, although he could play a little bit, it takes a chunk out of your leg, nearly mm. finishes your career as a very young man. Presumably yeah. you're playing for Clyde then. No, I Played for like the Dandies. So who were the defenders then? in that era, who you found equally street smart or very hard to, to play against? The defenders are working under... You, you, I've got total freedom, they don't. Yeah, OK. That's the difference. They've got to look after me, somehow. And they've got to look at the ball at the same time. And they've got to cover... I've got nothing. I've just got to find the space. That's all I've got to do. There's a big difference between being a defender and a striker, of course. One's got to defend and take care of a lot, and he's tied down, he's got a job to do. I don't. I, my job is only to score a goal, and I can do that any way I like. I've never had any manager that would say to me, I want you to do this, that, and next. And if they did, I wasn't even listening. because You're uh, serious about that now? You, you Deaf ear to somebody saying, Steve, do this? or would you No, I listened, but it just disappeared in that one, not that one. Because you judged, you've, you've got a football computer up here that your brain, about what you should be doing in which <clears> circumstances, <throat> dictated better than any coach could tell you in a particular game or era. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, in the majority of the, uh, the coaches, a lot of the coaches, there was only one striker, I think, in my coaches, and that was Fergie. People had a totally different way from me in a different era. Yeah. And... Um, but he didn't. To be fair, he didn't. He didn't go into detail and in, and in, in advice. And you know, he just he would say like, play close to Joe, Joe Harper. Now Joe, I would listen to him because I'm on the pitch. He's on the pitch beside me, and I look up to Joe and I think, well, you know, he's got the movement. He scored the goal, so he's got something I've got to find. I've got to look at. I've got to get that. How do I get that? So then Joe takes me under his wing and and uh, you know and and helps me in any way he can. But even Joe said some things to me like a simple step over in the game. Where the ball comes in from out wide, first man steps over, second man just and he spins, and second man just leaves it in his path again. I say, yeah, yeah, sounds good. 
game comes, it's gone. It's gone. I've got no idea what, what he's talking about. <laughs> I've got no idea because I just start uh, the game then at 21. I'm at, at 21 into professional football. So I'm going from, from Clyde, who are uh, a second division team and didn't have that kind of quality. And, you know, we're fighting for our lives there and yeah. fighting for our future and fighting for whatever we're fighting for. Uh, and then you go and play with a top pro like like Joe Harper, you know, and you, you can't learn that quickly. You can't. You learn a lot of things quickly, mm-hmm. but you know, when I try to tell tell you technical things, your natural ability takes over, mm-hmm. and and that stuff that they try to tell you don't really understand just disappears. What did Joe have? I think Joe, maybe because of his shape, maybe because of the lack of television, constant coverage, knows it's a little bit underrated. His goal total for Aberdeen was, was extraordinary. But I always thought he was a very, very clever, very technically good footballer. Joe was never underrated in, in the actual, in the professional world. The players never underrated Joe, never. They could try and kick him, but he was strong as an ox. His balance was fantastic. He could shoot with either foot. He was good in the air for a little guy, very good in the air. He was uh, intelligent on the pitch. He was generous to his strike partner, and he was a fantastic goal scorer. Jeez, they feared him. They feared him. Now, everybody feared him. There's no doubt about that. He couldn't leave Joe alone for a minute. Not for half a minute. Did he share something with you that he was always aware of what he should He's be always doing? talking what? to me. Mm-hmm. Always talking to me. He would say, 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 come in here, come in behind me, or I'm going here, or, or, and hold it there, and he just talked to me constantly through the game. You, you mentioned Alec Ferguson, and so many of our listeners will only know him as a very, very successful man manager, football club manager. But he, he was a centre forward too. What awareness did, had your paths crossed? He was at East Stirling at a certain stage. Mm. Did, did, had you seen him as a footballer? What did you know of him when he, when he comes in the door? At, no, I didn't know you? anything of uh, Alec Ferguson. I knew he was coming from St Mirren, that was it. Nothing else. Zero. He tells a story because you know, he's one of the most famous men in you know, post-war football now, or, yeah. or anywhere in the world. Yeah, at that stage, I think... But not as a player. No, not as a player, No. That's what I mean. So the trajectory is is a huge one. In that he was a, not an unsuccessful player, but I don't think he was a particularly uh, crafted centre forward. He was an old style centre forward. He was physical, yeah. Classics yeah. number nine, yeah. What were the first impacts as he takes over? What do, what did you notice? I noticed that he was um, quite aggressive. In fact, in the first day in training. We were um, on the pitch and, you know, the, the press were in and we were playing a little five against two in the halfway line on the, on the close to the touch line. You know, the press were all along there and somebody was shouting, Fergie, Fergie. He never turned around, never moved. He said, Fergie, Fergie. He must have said about 25 times. Finally, he said, hold it. Stopped uh, training and he walked over to the guy and, and, uh, and tore around. And he said something like, do you know me? Are we friends? Oh, we, and he, he and, and the, the the journalist was a little bit taken aback. He said, "He said, no, no, it's just that." He said, "Well, my name's Mr. Ferguson or Alex," and then that was the, the end of the conversation with the journalist, and then went back into training. So, which was a good, I think, uh, from from his point of view, it's a good marker that he set down in front of everybody, press and us. Yep. I think that your characters. My impression is that your characters meshed; that you were good for each other. I, I don't know if there were sparks or falling outs, but I think that you're his type of footballer, and I think that his manner, I don't know if it inspires you or it brings the best out of you, or it, or it just happened to be that you were going to do what you were going to do without him anyway. But was the blend quite productive between the two of you? You know, I, I was definitely going to do what I was going to do without him, no matter who was there. There's no, no doubt about that, um, because Billy McNeil took me to Aberdeen, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. not Alec. And, uh, and Billy was good as well. I enjoyed working under Billy and, and had a connection with him and had a connection with Alec. Different type of con- connection, but I did a lot. When Billy first came to Clyde, he came in as Billy McNeil, and you know everybody knew who Billy McNeil was, of course. <laughs> first guy, British guy to, look, to list, lift the European Cup. And, and he came in and he had a shirt and tie on, and he was come in like a real, you would imagine, a real manager to be. And that's into the little Clyde dressing room. He came in as assistant, and uh, he started talking. He was very authoritative. And uh, it was great, and I enjoyed it. I mean, he had a great manner with people, and he was a good man management, and I enjoyed it. But he was only there for six months, then went to Aberdeen, took me with him, of course, and, and that's how I got there. So I would have done the same for, for him. I wouldn't have done it for... I'm not doing it for him. I'm doing it because he's given me the chance. Mm-hmm. I was doing it, whether it was him or whoever it was, I was doing it because I was 
you know, it was my mindset. Title winner at Aberdeen. Mm. What was the sensation of being champion of a country like? Well, it, it's being champions of um, of Scotland was was no mean feat, of course, because Rangers Celtic were two big clubs, and for a provincial club, as they called us, to, okay. be, okay. to as they called us, we'll get over to it. become okay. champions. <laughs> um, was uh, and they kept saying it and saying the provincial club, you know, and. Yeah. And uh, for us to become champions, doing it with the style that we did it, was uh, was exceptional. Yeah, and it was and it was great. And you know, it was a gradual build up and build up. We got stronger, mentally stronger. Went to Ibrox, went to Parkhead, beat them down there, beat them up there, beat everybody. And there was strength of character, and a strength of belief, and of course, we had, there was bundles of ability in the in the club. It, I got those two Celtic games because obviously I, I knew less then than I do now so let's just call it nothing but two games in the space of 10 days at Parkhead seemed to me to be something that was if it wasn't asking too much it was asking a lot to, to, to win there once every couple of seasons as I grew up was a mm. huge deal um, what was Parkhead like then because my memory is it was bigger more hostile but maybe you're going to tell me that things like that are irrelevant to a man like you I don't, I don't know well they are irrelevant because you're not playing the crowd, you're only playing the living guys in front of you, right? Not every footballer thinks that way, no, I, I, I believe. No, for sure they don't, and, and that's their downfall on a lot of occasions. But if you think that way, don't even go onto the pitch, because you go onto the pitch and you go to a place like Parkhead or Ibrox or, 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 or Madrid or wherever you go to and it's a hostile crowd, then <laughs> what's the point? You know, the crowd not going to come over and come over the, the wall and... And, and kill you, although maybe... Can I take a shoot with you on that one? I've been at Pataudry where the Rangers fans did come over the wall. And yeah. I think they were aiming for me at the time, but... But these are exceptional yeah. c- yeah, circumstances, yeah. that's it. Okay, you know, okay. In general terms, yeah. you're, you're safe. There's a referee there, you're safe. There's police control, they're safe. So that's all in the back of you. That's all tucked away and gone, so forget that. Um, and you ask about, about how was that mentally and how difficult was that? You've got to ask yourself, how difficult was that for Celtic to have us coming because he knew how strong we were. So they're thinking to themselves, to come down again, they're fire, they're flying. So they, they could, it's, it's another question, not difficult for us, how difficult was it for them? Love it. By the end of that season, Tottenham Hotspur, a very, very well-constructed squad, uh, want you. When, when do you become, as a professional footballer in that era at least, when do you become aware that Spurs won't you? How, how does something like that filter to you? Press. Written press? Yeah. Or, or some, from some of the press, press. <clears throat> phoning you up and saying, listen, I'm acting on behalf of the club, or, or what's the process no. then? The initial, the initial thing is that you see bits and pieces in the press because maybe a Spurs scout was at Aberdeen against whoever game. And then the press put two and two together and sometimes come up with five, but in the cases come up with four, the right answer. And then you see that and you think that, well, was that true or not? So you go and see it in my and ask the manager if it's true or not, mm-hmm. and and he either tell you or he won't, and uh, and that's where it all starts. Let's put meat on the bones there. So you knocked on Alex door and said that uh, our spurs in for me. Of course, yeah. And how did that conversation go? Yeah, well, there was lots of conversations. It, was, it wasn't just one, because uh, I think the first one he said, uh, yeah, well, nah, it's just press talk, and if anybody comes in for you, I'll tell you. No, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I recognise now we're getting to something I, I do recognise, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then of course it would continue because it was true. Yeah. Spurs would come up again and, uh, and then maybe somebody might ask Spurs, a person might say, Well, yeah, yeah, we're looking in and we might be interested and then I'll you know that, that the first thing you're sure about deal. It, though is is when, when well, it's, again through the press and then Maybe something that, that Alec might have said to me, and it wasn't as convincing as the first time that yeah. you know that it, it wasn't really true mm. the first time. But this time, maybe his wording was a little bit different, so you get the, the vibe that it might be true. Was was London football? Was England an ambition for you prior to Spurs coming in? Was it something you thought, yeah, I want to do that? Yeah, yeah, because I used to watch uh, television as we all did, and we watched uh, the English league, and you watched Liverpool, the great Liverpool teams at that time, and. And I remember watching them and, and thinking that's a different type of football from what from what we play up here and there was something a little bit different, it seemed mm-hmm. to be smoother or something. It was just I couldn't work it out in my head what it was. 
uh, how Liverpool play or the English team played seemed a little bit slower or smoother or, or not so savage or something there was something about that football that attracted me to it I could never work it out so you know I looked at it and I thought I'd like to play in that football you caught my imagination there really genuinely because your descri- I mean, this is not there's no bullshit your description of your awareness on the pitch your description of your football intelligence as in conversations we've had previously it transfixes me so seeing that football on television gave you an image that something was a little bit better, different, more, maybe not more subtle, but it, it caught your attention. And yet it took you time to work out what it was that you were seeing that had impacted you? It took a long time, yeah. It was, it was like it was, in my naive way, it seemed to be like in my Glasgow education and everything else, I sort of thought that looks a little bit more posh than my football. You know, and that, that yeah. was a word that came into my yeah. head as well. And then I discarded that, but it did come into my head. Yeah, and yeah. I was trying to find the word for it, or trying to find it in my mind what it was. But I could never what I'm about it. to argue is I don't think it can have been because you were watching on television more players who were technically able, which if you watch the difference now, you, you would be seeing, I think, or certainly in the 90s that was the case, because you came from a Scottish football where there was a huge number of very able, technically gifted yeah, footballers. Yeah, but, but it was... It's, Maybe it was less physical. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, there was tons of fantastic players, of course, in, in that era when I was growing up. And But it was more, it was more, I don't know, rambunctious or physical or, mm-hmm. or violent or something. There was just an edge to ours that they didn't have. They'd, it was sophisticated, probably. Sophisticated. A little bit more sophisticated. What, Seemed to be. What are the elements that make you say yes to Spurs? Let's just say... The, the money is going to be better than Aberdeen. Let's put that to one side. Hmm. Is that all? Or did you take other things into account? No, nah, it was absolutely nothing to do with money, ever. It was never, ever anything to do with money, ever. And, um, of course, we were all interested in money. And I knew it was going to be an increase in salary. There's yeah. no doubt about that. So yeah. that's t- it's like the, the crowd, you know, they can't beat you up. The crowd, they're there. Yeah, that's okay. away in the background. So okay. the money, you know, is away in the background. So you just got to concentrate on where you want to go or... Or if you've got options where you want to go, or you want to go to this club that's come in for you, and, and then you start thinking about it. But uh, the um, the main thing that uh, probably the, 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 that pushed me towards Spurs was Ian Scanlon. He scanned for surprise. Scanned the man. Yeah. That scan was a fantastic man. Was it? Did he have some sort of? Was it six times he liked to beat a fullback? Did he have a set number of times he had to go around the fullback scanners? He certainly liked to do it more than once. <laughs> let's see. And he had uh, he was like a he was like a rubber man. We called him the rubber man because he was so you know he had to sway to his, he his body. He was extraordinary, wasn't he? Yeah. Honest, I have to say, on his day he was he, I love he was unplayable. We, on his day we, he was unplayable. When 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 the black day happens and you leave us, which did seem like a black day at the time, you know we were going to get Peter Weir. Mm. who was a gorgeous footballer and Alec once described him as something like the extra element he said the player that lifted us on European nights was Peter so Peter became mm. you know it wasn't the end of the world when Scanners but, but boy if you go to any game in any weather in Aberdeen with, or the, the wind howling in off the North Sea and you knew Scanners yeah. was playing you'd have paid probably twice what the ticket was costing you just to, just to watch yeah. him torment some guy <laughs> into his in legs the falling off and he didn't know how to play any other way he just loved to keep the ball and beat people and then and then beat them again, beat them again. And then, after you screamed at, screamed at him ten times, <laughs> then he'd whip it in. But he was a good man and it, he was a big friend of mine. Oh, I did, well, I'm delighted to hear that. I didn't know that. Um, he's, he's a central part of my youth, my growing mm. up, because uh, he, he gave me the, the belief that football could be cheeky and extravagant and daring, um, as well as methodical and intelligent mm. and strategic, and which... A lot of the players in your era taught me, which I think was a good education. Mm. But Ian had been at Notts County, right? Yeah. Is this where we're going about how he, how, how the heck is Scanners a part of you choosing Spurs? Hold on, don't call him Scanners. He's called Scan. Okay. okay. Scan the man. Scan the man. Scan the man. Scan your pal. And Shep. And um, how did he? Be, how did he? What? You said that <clears throat> Scan the man is a central element of you choosing Spurs. Oh yeah, yeah. How the hell? Because he'd come from up from England, <clears throat> an experience of England, and there was two teams uh, that were in for me at that time. One was Spurs, and one was um, Crystal Palace. Mm. Palace were a team of the eighties because Terry Venables was a manager, and uh, you know, and, and Spurs had just come up. They'd been relegated, mm-hmm. 
and uh, so Scan uh, was my advisor, my personal advisor. Every single day I would pick him up on the way into the club, every single day. And uh, he'd say, you've got to go to Spurs. Spurs, yeah. forget Crystal Palace, <laughs> Spurs, blah, every single day. I said, yeah. but, but, he said, no, no buts, Spurs, every oh. single day. I, I mean, it was brainwashing. But really, he said, I'm telling you, you don't know, I know. He said, I've been there, I know the clubs, you've got to Spurs. So his passion came for from... His uh, admiration for what he'd savoured while he was playing for Notts County. Yeah, of course. His experience of, of his knowledge and experience of big clubs, and he was 100 percent correct. <clears throat> correct, because Spurs was bigger of two clubs, although yes. they'd been down. Yep. But as, as, a, as a history and as a club and a future, Spurs were with the club. There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> what did you find when you got there? Because um, I remember it's an era of of that squad was peppered with sort of. Hard, strong characters, but also wonderful footballers. That that seemed to be a squad that was really well put together, and that there was balance right mm. across the pitch. A real, again from a distance, it appeared a real unit. Well, it was it was um, it was lacking, and it was lacking goal scorers. Simple as that. They had good uh, midfield players, of course. Um, since big. Pat had left them and gone to Arsenal. Then they were struggling a little bit in the goalkeeping department. Although Barry Danes did really well, but you know that was a general perception of the whole thing. And Danes he was a good guy and he saved us a lot of times. But you know it was a general perception, and uh, and maybe defensively we were lacking in one or two positions. But midfield, <coughs> midfield was uh, was talented, mm-hmm. very very talented. Because you had Glenn Hoddle in there, you had uh, Ricky Vila, you had Ozzy. Mickey Hazard was in there, so it was a bundle of talent in there. When um, we spoke to, to off tape, I, I mentioned this to you that it was a shock to me that Charlie Nicholas and, and Frank McAvenny both really struggled in London. And um, Charlie said that he had to get his sister to come down and live with him mm. just to, to keep him company, to make him feel human because London was sort of devouring him. He wasn't ready for it. And, and Frank said he was about to go home, which again... I think contrasts with everybody's images of them, false images though they may have been. Um, how did you cope with London? Cope with it? Yeah. It's not a question of coping with it. For me. It wasn't a question of coping with it for me. It was London, again, is, is something in the back. All you've got to do is, is go into the club that's just signed you, Understand if you fit in there, first of all, if you mm-hmm. can cope with it and deal with it, if you're talented enough to deal with it, and then everything else takes care of itself. That's it. Because you're, you're there as a footballer, you're not there to go and see the, the streets of London and sightseeing, and you're not going there to, to talk to Londoners, you're not going there to, to open shops, you're only going there to make sure you do your job. And the, the primary objective for anybody going to a club is when you get there, is to make sure you fit or you can add to it, and you're up to their level. And and when that happens, then everything else is... There's no worry in anything else. You get your house, you're relaxed, and you concentrate on your football. That's it. You don't concentrate on in, in going out for a McDonald's at, uh, after training. You don't concentrate on going for a drink on a any time during the week. You just concentrate. You just go there and live and do it. And I had absolutely no problem whatsoever settling out in London. Zero. I meant that because it can be a... a because, a, sorry, yeah. just to finish on that, because yeah. when you do that and you go in there and you settle into a club and you can see it's, it's, it's right for you because you, you're a good enough quality and you can add to it, then that gives you all the other confidence you need. But then you've got to be happy in your own skin that you can live with yourself and and you can, you know, and, and sometimes you can, as, as Charlie said and Frank McAvenny have said that you just mentioned, that they go there, maybe they went there alone or maybe I, I don't know what the circumstances they did. were. They did, Well, you know, you... you but I'm convinced if my circumstances would have been the same, it wouldn't have caused me a problem because I can live in my own skin. I've got no problem. I can live with myself. I can, I can be there. As long as I've got my football, mm-hmm. which is the be-all and the end-all for me, then I'm a happy man. It's like when I asked you about the, the, the football intelligence self-taught, who, who was it, and you largely self-taught and self-developed as well. That, um, that attitude, focus towards what your professional responsibilities were and what, what your um, how to realise your ambitions. Again, that is something that I don't encounter well, regularly in football, Steve. It might seem second nature to you because you've lived your life all that way, but it isn't, that isn't the norm. 
It isn't. I don't. It's my norm. But you've seen her. You've seen around football more than more than I have. Yeah, of course. Am I wrong? That's that's not. not I see players who make naive decisions, who have got a complete lack of focus about what you've just um, enunciated. Who need a manager or an agent or an older guru figure at a club to say, "Listen, or a son, captain at a club, for example." Mm. Now you didn't need that, but around you, you must have seen what I'm talking about. That these norms, these rules that you've just laid down, bare bones. Yeah. Around you, that wasn't the case generally. No, no, you can see around you that that, um, and you can see each individual. You, you, you know, a player. You can tell a person's character really from how he plays in a football pitch, and how he conducts himself in the pitch, type he is, and in training. So you, you work that out immediately. Well, at least it, it was for me. I could work it out immediately. I knew, I knew who was uh, really I could depend on. I knew who was. I'm not sure about him because uh, you know if I need this, then uh, you know it's not going. He's not going to be there for me, or I can communicate with him, or you know I'm going to work with him because I know he's the future for me. Mm. You know, you, you you do all that very quickly and and uh, and you work it out. It's it's for me it wasn't difficult because I know what my play needs. You know, if I've got a central back, a central defender, a central midfield player, sorry, behind me, I know immediately if he's going to be right for me. And if he is, then great. Then we link up right away and we, we make that connection right away. I make the runs knowing how he plays. He sees it. When he lifts his head, he sees it and he thinks, well, brilliant, bang, and it goes. He doesn't never, ever, no, ever, no midfield player ever dictated to me, ever. The striker always dictates the midfield player. Although people say, yeah, you know, the midfield player here, run the game. Yeah, fine, you can run a midfield game, never run my game. <clears throat> you can never run a striker's game. And, uh, and it's a lesson for, for, for clubs that they should prioritise the strikers because you will never win anything unless the strikers score your goals. Mm-hmm. You can have the best midfield player in, uh, 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 midfield in, the, in the, the business, but if you knock at the, the strikers that are going to put the ball in the back of the net, you'll win nothing. The Big Interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear, the music that you love, is Beer Jacket, who's always been there for us. You can keep up with everything that we do by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv. How many times do I have to tell you? Yes, several thousand of you have done it, but come on, slackers at the back, sign up. That grahamhunter.tv site is also where you can buy the new updated version of my book, Barca, The Making of the Greatest Team in the World. It's my account of the Guardiola era at the Camp Nou from 2008 until 2012, plus Tito, Tata and Adios Johan Cruyff. It is in all good bookshops now, but it does also make a big difference to all of us who've worked on the project. If you choose to buy direct, particularly for Christmas at grahamhunter.tv forward slash books. You'll be sure to get the new edition and you will be helping us to continue producing independent content. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon.